This video is brought to you by Storyblocks. Storyblocks is a one-stop shop for stock video footage, effects, images, and more with royalty-free, subscription-based, accessibly priced, unlimited downloads. We use Storyblocks with turnaround times and low predictable costs that were unimaginable just a few years ago for channels and small production firms like ours or yours. If you're a video creator with an ambitious vision for a project, a one-man band, a small agency, or a production company, leveraging the reach and skill of people around the world through existing assets that they've created is the way to achieve that vision in the shortest, most cost-effective time frame possible. No worries about monetization or copyright issues. Whatever your project, stock footage, stock music, stock effects can become key. To learn more, visit them at storyblocks.com slash hue. Thanks, Storyblocks. Too many of us, first-time buyers, wise and old pros, bloggers, journalists, YouTubers like me, too often get caught up in specifications. Specs. It's as if we've lost our minds. Too many of us turned into perfect little reach and frequency bots who have been so bombarded by consistent, insistent messaging about specifications. That is, the number of things we can select via software, measure via charts, customize via function button, or incrementally upgrade to, per dollar, that specs supersede all other considerations combined, and we buy on that basis alone. Which is why, as best I can tell, just about nobody fully understands Sony's A7C, but no worries, I'm here to fix that. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I'd like to talk to you about Sony's $1,800 full-frame A7C, a little more than half a year after it was first announced, now that I've had it in hand for the past few days. What I don't want to do is go through the specs. You can read those on your own. You can watch a pile of videos that were released at the time, including my own. I'll put a link to it down in the show notes below, and a whole pile more that have been released over the last seven or eight months. You probably know all the specs anyway. Though, I will tell you that the single biggest thing most people don't mention is the fact that for all the hubbub about autofocus improvements over the a7 III, the a7C does not have real-time tracking in video, which, as far as I'm concerned, is a big miss. Then again, you'd have to pay at least $3,500 to get that feature by picking up an A7S III, $3,900 for an FX III, or $6,500 for an A1, so let's not get piggy. And you can do a lot with good, fast, plain old continuous autofocus. Although, while we're at it, the A7C does carry over the HDMI limitations of the A7 III, which means if I want to record in 4K, I can only send a clean HDMI signal out, unlike 1080 where it's no problem. Which is fine if that's what you want, but if you're a YouTuber or an educator and want to record in 4K but still see, say, your audio levels from the monitor, tough noogies. Okay, I'll also tell you the in-body image stabilization is only really useful for stills, and then less than I thought or what I'll call tripod mode when in video, you know, just standing still or simple pans. Post-production stabilization for video using gyro data can be better than IBIS if you don't look at the frame's edges and don't mind the 10% or so crop. But if you're serious about smooth dynamic shots, a $280 Ronin SC gimbal is better. And if you want to vlog by walking around with your arms sticking out in front of you, a $350 Osmo Pocket 2 is best of all. Then again, Let's take a step back, because the last thing I want to tell you for the moment is, on the other hand, that complaints about things like fewer function buttons, or a missing joystick, or a smaller grip, or the same old sensor, or same old menu system instead of the new one of the A7S III, or that it doesn't have exactly the same layout as the A6600, or that it doesn't have the one eight thousandth top shutter speed, hold that thought, or the larger half inch, still 2.4 million dot EVF, or the second card slot of the A7 III, doesn't offer 4K 60p this, 10 bit, yada yada that, miss the point of the A7C entirely. Now, 
It is true that the A7C is the new shiny thing to win over Sony's APS-C fans into full frame, and this is part of Sony's grand design to maintain profitability in a permanently shrunken market. So this is, if not the most interesting thing about it, an interesting point nonetheless. It is, after all, approximately the same size, shape, and weight as the APS-C A6600, yet you thought I was going to say, has a full-frame sensor, superior autofocus, improved color signs, full flippy screen, blah 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 No, not that. It's that the A7C is $500, that is 42% more expensive than the A6600, with the same dinky EVF, now with repackaged A7 III internals, three years old, except for the IBIS unit, and $100 more than the A7 III is now selling these days. In other words, very smart. Cost-effective and margin-retaining for Sony, a real enticement for at least some A6 series owners to upgrade without breaking the bank. And fair enough, you are getting those things I just mentioned. Although, I think, as long as you light your scenes and don't live at f1.2, the single biggest functional upgrade is unlimited video recording. Even if I would not count on it in high heat under midday sun for delivering anything close to the thermal management of the A7S III, never mind a GH5. Yeah, the weather hasn't cooperated, so I can't demonstrate this or tell you conclusively where that limit is. But I am recording with it right now. I am finally, finally not worried about overheating at room temperature, as I was even with firmware updates when I owned first an A6000, then an A6300. I never really put our A6400 to the test, but no matter. It's not really about any of those other things per se. Rather, from a Sony A6 whatever shooter's perspective... The thing about the A7C that is most likely to get them across the goal line is that because of these things, the A7C offers the lowest friction migration from APS-C to full frame where the camera can take full advantage of Sony's best lenses. And they are making some great glass right now. I think this is the critical advantage of the A7C. Until its arrival, A6 shooters had to, generally speaking, settle for lesser APS-C glass from Sony, go the independent lens manufacturer route, or pay more for full-frame coverage lenses from which they could not extract the full value given their smaller sensors. Which, for many, was fine. Until recently, the Sony APS-C system gave them what they needed at a significant cost, size, and weight savings, even more than fine, if they wanted the camera's crop sensor to turn, say, Sony's 200 to 600 millimeter zoom into a 350 to 900 millimeter optic for birding or sports. But now, I think the implicit rationale Sony has put before its APS C fans with the A7C is this Get the most from your investment in glass and protect that investment by going full frame all the way, lens and body. This is the camera body to do it. Stretch to find that extra 500 bucks because, and here I think is the implicit part, we, Sony, are simply not going to give you a comparably diverse and performant APS-C coverage only lens line. We need to make up for profits lost from a permanently shrunken market somehow, and if it ain't volume, it's gonna be margin. Now, I don't mean to be snarky. I just want to be clear, especially because I don't begrudge them a business decision like this. It's very much like why Ford exited the car business, but kept the trucks. It's what Sony needs to do to survive. It is equally true that the A7C is a shot across the bow to other APS-C interchangeable lens camera makers. Canon, Nikon, perhaps most impactfully Fujifilm and Leica, and Micro Four Thirds manufacturers Panasonic and JIP, new owners of the Olympus Micro Four Thirds catalog. And full-frame interchangeable lens camera makers. All of them, but Leica and Sigma especially. I mean, a full-frame rangefinder-style hybrid, as small as an APS-C camera but without recording limit, with a flippy screen, and IBIS, and class-leading autofocus, and priced somewhere between not insignificantly but not insurmountably more, and thousands less? Good night, Irene. Especially since it's obvious that if they can stuff a 24-megapixel sensor in the A7C, they can stuff a 61-megapixel sensor in there just as easily as Sigma can. But these things still miss what to me remains the most interesting thing about the A7C. The most interesting thing about the A7C to me is that it is the first interchangeable lens camera in E-mount I've ever seen where Sony has made a conscious decision to improve their industrial design by eliminating clutter and reducing the camera's size. Bravo, especially if it's a harbinger of things to come. 
It doesn't have the compelling unified design vocabulary of a Leica M or a Sigma FP, but it is a start. It is cleaner than any alpha interchangeable lens camera now. And it is, in any meaningful way, now the smallest full-frame interchangeable lens camera on the market, bar none. Once you add Sigma's new EVF11 to their FP or FPL, for example, the A7C is notably smaller. The A7C is only marginally larger than the FP without the EVF11, yet Sony manages to cram in, okay, really dinky, integrated EVF. IBIS, okay, only fair to middling stabilization. An articulating rear panel, okay, a smaller panel, measured diagonally than the one in the A6600, not particularly high resolution, and you do have to set it to sunlight to make it usable outside the studio. And, excellent, utterly superior, no qualifiers, autofocus. It also offers a vastly wider and deeper array of native mount lenses. It's also smaller than a Leica M10 with the Type 20 Visoflex 2, never mind that it is about 200 grams lighter and just about one-fifth the price. Though, with that dinky EVF, I wouldn't exactly enjoy focusing an M mount lens with it. But until an A7C Mark II, call it an 8C, a 9C maybe, matches the delight of shooting with an M, that size, weight, and price advantage will have to do. And for most of us, it will. Perhaps an even more telling comparison, though, is this. The full-frame A7C with Zeiss 55 1.8, a $2,700 combo, is roughly the same size and weight as one of my favorite camera lens combinations on the planet for street photography, really photography of all sorts, like as autofocusing APS-C CL with their Sumilux TL35 1.4, which will set you back almost three times as much, a cool $6,100. Beyond the price advantage, the A7C focuses faster and surer and is a far more versatile tool for video and low light. Though it has nowhere near the industrial design, ergos, software interface, EVF, build quality, charm, heritage, or talismanic quality of the CL, for me. And the CL has never stopped me from getting the image I wanted. Quite the opposite. Other than an M, it has been the most enjoyable way to get the image, the most inspiring of all cameras. Though I only use it for stills and I like it that way. Outstanding real world 4K video quality notwithstanding. And you can narrow that price difference a whopping two grand by swapping out the Sumalux for Sigma's full frame $640 DGDN 35 F2, which is a great little lens or their $900 35 1.4. But you may not care. You may not be able to afford to care or you may simply disagree. I understand. Especially when I tell you that the A7C combo gave away almost nothing optically to the CL combo other than focus breathing. That 55 1.8 is a dragon. When I took a few shots at local automotive restoration legend Richard Mullen Coach Building. Which, on the one hand, may surprise you when I put it that way. After all, full frame, right? Not really. Full frame, per se, matters a lot less than most of us recognize most of the time. I quickly became bored pixel peeping because there was so little between them. A little more chromatic aberration on one shot, a little less on the next. A little sharper here, a little less there. A little more noise, a little less noise. I'd give the nod to the Sumalux just barely, but the option the A7C Zeiss combo gives you that the CL can't is the ability to use the same glass with up to 61 megapixels of resolution. You'd have to move to the full-frame SL2 to get within striking distance of that resolution, but that means you'd have to buy full-frame L-mount glass for it. Turns out, neither Leica nor anyone else has a persuasive answer to the A7C. On the other hand, I was surprised that the A7C's IBIS didn't give it more of an advantage. Oh well. But again, back to what I consider most interesting. What if Sony has reached an inflection point where it embraces a less-is-more design philosophy? What if they are taking on the challenge articulated by Steve Jobs back in the day when he famously said, Simple can be harder than complex. And what if Sony, and we, were honest with ourselves about a bunch of other things? What if we acknowledged, for example, how few of the 35 gajillion possible combinations of features and functions of the A7C or most other modern cameras we actually use, which is like, what, 10? That the rest of it, ironically, is mostly noise that gets in the way. What if we all acknowledged that the difference between the menu on the A7C and A7S III is actually about as different as a command line in DOS on a monochrome screen and one on a color screen? I mean, it isn't exactly like moving to Big Sur.
What if we all acknowledge that the iPhone isn't so often a better camera simply because it's always on us, but because the interface is brilliant and does take into account what people actually use and need, designed to be the shortest distance between intent and execution? What if we stopped software bloat and specubating? Imagine if instead Sony made fundamental improvements to the UX by moving to a full graphical interface with full touch functionality. Imagine if they put back the front control dial and rear joystick. Imagine if Sony dumped that dinky 0.39 inch 0.59 X magnification 2.4 million dot EVF for their 9.44 or 5.7 million dot EVF, which is the wrong spec anyway, because dots aren't resolution. What if future product development fantasies aside, we recognize that the A7C is a compelling argument for extracting one's cranium from one's and acknowledging that, three years old or not, the absence of 10-bit color depth and 422 chroma sampling or not, dinky EVS this, no RTT AF in video that, that the A7C, even more than the A7 III before it, is as much camera as 99% of us need 99% of the time. Do we really need more? Do we really even need that much? It's only now in mid-2021, but it is happening that some of us are finally acknowledging that RAW does very little to actually help us in the world of YouTube and internet compression, beyond giving an editor the opportunity to fix mistakes made during capture, or a colorist the opportunity to grade heavy in post. That 8-bit long is just kind of silly, always was. That 10-bit doesn't matter that much either, or that 1080-60p for, yep, 99% of us 99% of the time, is just fine if it's done well. That 6K and 8K aren't worth the processing storage and post-production overhead. That while unlimited 4K recording is nice and some of us need it, most of us will never do a single 30-minute take, let alone have to contend with tropical heat and attendant overheating concerns. That, switching back to stills for a minute, a 30 frames per second burst rate with a buffer deep enough to handle it is not worth it either, unless you're a pro sports or wildlife photographer, have assistants you can torture by having them go through it, or are willing to let the kind of algorithms already in use on Apple's iPhone do the selection for you. As for sensor resolution, many of us have already come to the conclusion that 24 megapixels is more than enough, especially when printing. Unless we intend to crop the crap out of an image, even before we head out the door, using megapixels instead of more glass for each. But who the heck thinks like that anyway? Let me wrap it up this way. With the A7C and more recently, their ultra-compact 24, 40, and 50 millimeter moderately fast primes, Sony has shown for the first time since I started following them and then investing in them, that they are interested in integrating industrial design, aesthetics, usability, tactile sensation, and the joy that comes from successfully integrating all three in the same object with performance that its target audience needs and not more a priority. This is a big deal. I think it is the final frontier in Sony's evolution from a top-tier player grounded in electronics and optics to the top-tier player grounded in the complete user experience, the Apple of the dedicated camera world. I don't know if Sony's ambitions are that lofty, which is okay, more than okay. I think it's important to have multiple voices in the imaging industry, multiple sensibilities, multiple options. In the meantime, while the A7C is not yet the camera I'd like it to be, as is, it does beg the question, what if we just stopped specubating or whining and got on with shooting? You already know the answer. We'd be investing in ourselves, in our craft, our vision, our voice. With each trip of the shutter or push of the record button, each hour editing, each hour thinking about and planning for what we want our work to be, bringing us that much closer to Gladwell's 10,000 hours to mastery. And in that journey, that much closer to truly seeing ourselves. For those of us who haven't already figured this out, haven't yet settled on the tools for the journey, yes, the A7C with a couple of ultra-compact primes should be on your shortlist. I think it is the sweet spot in Sony's entire Alpha lineup, a compelling reason to enter the Sony ecosystem where it is, in fact, strongest, full frame. But, hey, if it doesn't speak to you, if a different brand or a different format does, I understand. It's all good. This video was brought to you by Storyblocks. To learn more, visit www.storyblocks.com. Thanks, Storyblocks.
If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of Our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com slash books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no-cost to you affiliate links down below. Picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com. Sending coffee money via PayPal or best of all, join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it. <laughs>